All right, um, we're glad to be back. Uh, this is Sober Sunday. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's been great conversations for the last two and a half months. Uh, we're grateful to many of you who have been writing to us and telling us uh, how much you've benefited out of uh, these conversations. Uh, we're grateful to have a wonderful guest today on this Sober Sunday. Uh, today we're talking about um, our children being at home for six more months. Uh, and to some parents, that's just um, uh, depressing. Uh, but we're saying these kids are gonna be with, that, with us at home. They're our children. They're, um, it looks like they're not going back to school uh, for the rest of the year. And we're talking about the joys, we're talking about the challenges uh, and also the opportunities. And so I know many of you that are listening today are parents or caregivers uh, or uh, just uh, young people who just want to understand the challenges uh, that we're going to be facing. And so um, I'm looking forward. This is going to be a very good conversation. Uh, feel free uh, to um, tell us where you're uh, listening in from. Uh, feel free to ask any questions we're going to uh, take a few of them during the conversation to make any comments and feel free also to invite your friends and to host um, watch parties uh, so that we have a lot more, especially parents uh, listening in and getting some uh, benefit out of this. And so I'm glad to have um, uh, today, uh, I'll start with Shalom Munuri. Uh, Shalom uh, is a trainer. Uh, she's a mother as well, as she's going to talk about. Um, and um, uh, she's a trainer, especially for teenagers. She does a lot of talks for, to parents about their teens, but also to teens, especially the girls uh, as well. And uh, we've been together at Mavuno Church. We've had a long, uh, you know, a long uh, history, and I'm glad to see you, Shalom. So you, you. you may say hi and tell us what more. We don't know about you, your family and all. Well, all right, uh, good. On the professional side, yes, I do training. I'm a speaker and an author. I've written some books, but the particular relevant one is called Eggs, Hammers, and Chili Peppers. It's uh, addressing how to, how to connect with teenagers, so to speak. I am a mom, I'm in a blended family, and I'm a mom of five children. <laughs> Let me not call them children, they're all young adults, because the oldest are 28, the youngest is 18. So it's been fun uh, parenting them in the different ways. And I'm looking forward to the conversations we're going to have. Excellent. And uh, we're glad to have you, Shalom. Uh, welcome. Terian Shabet, uh, I'm sure you know her. You've seen her on the screens, um, uh, TV personality, in the media a lot. Uh, she's a mother as well. Uh, so let me invite you, Terian, to introduce yourself and say what more you need to say. Well, thank you so much, um, Pastor S. It's really nice to be here today. And um, well, as you introduced me, I am a media personality. Sometimes I want to say former, uh, <laughs> but you know, they say once a journalist, always a, always a journalist. Um, and what makes this conversation really exciting for me and why I'm looking forward to it is that I recently quit my full-time job in the media. And one of the reasons was that you know experiencing this COVID period being home a lot more with my kids and I just said okay I'm quitting because I want to be home more with my children and still you know still sort of find a way of making an income but first and most importantly I want to be home more because I haven't been home uh, and Michael will probably allude to this as well who's been in the media for a long time it's the first time I've been home for you know like 15 years so 
so I'm I'm very happy right now. <laughs> in fact, yeah, when that six that's month that's thing came up, I said, yeah, that's fine. We can do six yeah. months at home, <laughs> and maybe I'll make up for what you know for for losing the the years that I that I lost, especially with my eldest. For lost time, making up for lost time. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Tarian. We're glad to have you here, and of course, we see you a lot on the adverts. And good job with that, uh, Michael Year. <laughs> Uh, my dear friend, um, welcome. We're glad to have you here. TV personality, trainer as well, um, and a father. Uh, so welcome, Mike. Thank you. And I, I, I need to agree with Terian. And coincidentally, Terian, it was after 14 to 15 years when I stopped and uh, came to the same realization of what happens to the body and that there's a whole different life that happens outside of media. But to Pastor Simon, thank you so much for having me here. <clears throat> and uh, by way of introduction, I'd say professionally, a counseling psychologist, a life leadership and communications coach, and Terian, I call myself a media um, practitioner as opposed to personality, but I think you're still a big personality. So you, since it's recent, um, a, I am a father. I say I'm a father of five children right now, but Pastor Simon is going to look at me like, what are you talking about? Five children because uh, biologically I have two daughters and a son, and my son has siblings also. So I, I'm in between the blended that uh, Shalom, Shalom spoke about. And, uh, and I have a big family, I would like to say, in terms of the children that I take as my own. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, media practitioner. It's good to have you here. And as a psychologist, uh, counseling psychologist, we look forward to hearing some perspectives, especially about to their parents and about our children and how we're bringing them up. Again, just want to encourage all of you as we listen in, feel free to ask questions, uh, to type, type them out on our pages, and we're gonna be able to uh, uh, pick a, a few of them. So let's start, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so we're talking about the stress that parents are going through during the season, but let's not go there yet. Huh? Let's talk about the exciting things. And I mean, Terian, you started us off that a lot of us, we have now more time with our children. We need to celebrate that. We need to enjoy that. Uh, we need to be happy that uh, they're around us, uh, you know, for all of this long time. Uh, and so I just love what you said, Terry Ann, and maybe it's a word to tell uh, those who are really busy, maybe in the media, uh, or those who have been in the air industry, um, uh, and, and other places where they were hardly home. Um, you know, the, 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 this is a time to enjoy being with your family. What would you like to say about that before you come to Shalom? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my, my daughter's, my daughter turned, my eldest daughter, I have two. So my eldest is, uh, just turned 14 in April and my little one is, uh, two. She's turning three in, in October. And, uh, you know, for the first time in forever, you know, in my, in my career life and for the first time as a parent, I've, I'm actually home early in the evening. I'm home early enough to cook. I'm home early enough to, you know, to sit down together, watch something on TV, eat together, uh, play together. And I think it's some of these things that we take for granted. Um, well, I took for granted as, um, you know, with my career and I, it was normal for me not to be home. And I realize now how much more fun it is, how much, you know, my, my the oldest who's 40 now is, you know, is growing into a young woman. And I was going to miss that, you know, and I wouldn't miss it for the world now. So we are, you know, we're growing closer bonds. We're talking a lot more. Um, I know her, you know, I can actually say now that I do know my, you know, my child. But if, yeah. you know, last year I may have said that I know her, but I, I honestly, you know, I, I didn't. But, you know, over the last couple of months, you know, we've been together, we cook together, we spend time together. Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's all, almost a silver lining 
uh, even though I don't, it's, you know, I mean, Corona is not a good thing, but the, for the silver lining for me has been the mm. fact that I feel that I'm a mother again. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I, I absolutely have enjoyed the last mm. couple of months and I'm looking forward to the next six months as well. Uh, well, that's good. Uh, that's good. And um, I think Mike was saying in psychology that um, those early years, especially uh, before eight, are very important, especially for the mother to be able to connect to the children. Uh, otherwise, you know, you may have children with closed spirit, uh, and it becomes very hard to open that up because they barely know you. Uh, and just to say to those who are busy out there, I think presence is the greatest blessing you can give to your children to the degree that you can, because circumstances vary. Uh, but to be present, to be there, uh, to watch them grow. Uh, Shalom, the parents of uh, teenagers, uh, you know, tend to disagree with that. You know, there are many who have called me in and said, these kids need to get out of home. You know, it's, uh, it's too much. It's not just about invading the fridge. Uh, and clearing everything in there. Uh, it's a lot more. A lot of them just don't know how to connect with these kids. They're moody, they want to lock themselves in the room. Uh, they're making noises, yeah, parents don't they, understand. There's more, there's more to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. There's more to yeah. talk about challenges with teenagers uh -huh. because we, we hardly see the joys. And a lot of the time, the joys will come from the relationship that you had beforehand. Because if you didn't have a good relationship beforehand, they've already gotten used to you not being around. And so a lot of parents of teenagers are finding that they're stifling each other. You know, the teenager is feeling crowded, bored. You know, in fact, I think the one word is extremely bored with yeah. being in the house. And yes, that sentiment of the need to be out there is very true because this is the time when they're forming their identity. So it's important for them to be bonding with their friends. And so I'm feeling like um, those who are finding creative ways of getting their teenagers to connect, you know, without just being on screen like this all the time, are having happier teenagers and are therefore having more joys. But then back to, mm -hmm. if you had a friendly, if I may call it, you know, I like using the name friendly loosely because I still believe parents are not supposed to be their children's friends in the way adults are friends with each other but you need to respect them the way you respect your friends. You know, there's a mutual relationship you need to have. Now, if you already had that, then you are thoroughly enjoying their presence. Because I mean, if I can speak from my experience, I'm thoroughly enjoying catching up on backlog of series and movies that we were watching with my daughter. And so it's just finding a balance of how to do that while she does school, you know, get the hours that we can put in together. So if you had a relationship before, then this has been an easier transition. Now, if you didn't have a relationship before, you know, like Terian is saying, this becomes the place to rediscover, to rebuild that relationship, you know, to start saying, oh yeah, we have certain interests that we have in common. So I feel as though, even if you started off not seeing the joys, if you look at that silver lining, or you look for that silver lining, you will find that to connect with them and their parents at this time. So there are lots of, yeah, there are lots of joys yeah. in the making. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So parents of teens, we need to be happy that they are around uh, because where there's no relationship, we're building one where there are challenges, we are solving them uh, because sometimes we run away from them. We don't want to face them, but this is a good time to be together uh, to deal with whatever we need to deal with. And Mike, you know, there are those parents who always look at the negatives, especially when it comes to, uh, to teenagers. Uh, but generally, you know, they, they are, uh, they're not in a good place, so they're not able to enjoy this. Uh, it's stressful for them. And once they're stressed, of course, they stress further uh, their children. Uh, maybe a word from your uh, background, uh, just to talk to parents about taking it easy and relaxing and beginning to see the joy in what, where we are. Yeah, as Teenagehood is, is like getting into a, a tunnel where the only people who understand you are your fellow teens who are in that tunnel with you. And you kind of hear from a distance the voices of those who are parents or call themselves wiser. And you see a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's dark. 
So you only keep on moving because you just know your, your body is growing and you're developing. I, I would say, in, in addition to what Shalom has said, don't tie a parent in um, speaking those things and reminding those things, but not in the same way as you did when they were children, younger, in a different way now. Because they're going through a very, a very, um, at, that, at this point of teens, they're trying to find their identity. And as they try to find their identity in mind, in heart, with their relationships, their bodies are doing things also. So it, it can be a very confusing uh, time and that room to just discover and to not, not even discover, to process. I think that's the, the word, to process. And please do assist them in processing some of this information, not in judging them for what they think about the information. Because I think, Shalom, you might say, you might add, Terian, through your experience, if you judge, they shut down. Oh, yeah. And they will find another place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well. Look, look, Master Simon, I, I wanted to just say, uh -huh. you said, you know, that the, the initial years are very critical, especially for mothers. I, I disagree. Especially for parents, mother and father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. So uh, I was just emphasizing mothers because it's... it's, it's uh, primary care givers very early. Uh, if they don't connect, it becomes very difficult. But thank you for emphasizing that as well. When we talk with fathers, we tell them presence is very important. If you don't start them off uh, to connect with your children, then later you're gonna be a stranger. Uh, you're gonna be a stranger. Uh, even when you cannot be able to do some of the things that mom is doing, breastfeeding and the rest, uh, that increases bonding. You still need to be there to play with them, enjoy, and so I, I think we are talking about um, enjoying the relationships. I think that's what we're saying. There's a beauty and blessing of relationships right now. Time is of essence when it comes to relationship. Uh, and so we need to use the time and use it to have fun and to play games and to do stuff that we were not doing before. Uh, we need time to discover one another. One of the things we do with our children here at home uh, is uh, regularly talk about what strengths we're seeing in each other. And we're beginning to discover each other a lot more than we had before. Be able to say, this week, this is what I've seen in you that I've really celebrated. And we just go around and talk with each other. We're playing more games together, watching more TV together, running and walking together a lot more. I mean, we are just enjoying rediscovering one another. Uh, and of course, uh, realizing that food doesn't, uh, you know, uh, stay very long in the fridge uh, with all of these kids here. Uh, but we're enjoying that as well, you know, replenishing the fridge all the time. Uh, but I know most of the parents really what they want to hear is the challenges, how we deal with the challenges of being at home, um, the challenge of the parents, but also the challenge of the kids. Um, uh, kids get stressed because they have a lot of energy. They want to be out. They can't see their friends. There are just lots of challenges. Terry Ann, maybe you could just highlight a few of the challenges you have faced um, uh, as a mom, uh, but you've heard from your fellow moms um, and, and how you're turning that into opportunity or some of the things you're doing uh, to handle that. Terry Ann. So um, just... Um, on today's Sunday, on Thursday, I had a very interesting conversation with my eldest. And I realized that because I have been, I've been home so much, I've sort of let go the boundaries a little bit. You know, if we're supposed to sleep at eight, now we can push it a little farther because, oh, we're watching a movie together or we're playing something. And then I got sort of, you know, got a hold of myself and said, no, 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 no. You know, we, we have sleep three times and you know, we have to go back to what, you know, whatever time we're supposed to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so her sleeping time during school days is uh, 8.30. Uh, but now since there's no school, um, I, you know, I said, you know, you can sleep at 10, which is pushing the boundaries way beyond, I, you know, way beyond anything I ever have. But even then we had, we had a fight about it. 
And, you know, she, she's like, but why? I'm not going to school tomorrow. I'm not going to school for six months. Mm-hmm. And so the pushback was so abrasive that it, it actually threw me off a little bit. So, so my eldest is a bit of um, an activist <laughs> in our home. So she's, you know, she's, so she's very, very strong wheeled, very, you know, she's, she's a bit of a fight. And, and then, you know, so for me, I realized I still have to put my foot down. I am the mother of the house. I may be a little soft, spoken. I may be a lot shorter than you are. I may be, you know, but I'm still the, the mom of the house. So I said, yeah. and she said, so why? I said, because I said so. And the rules of the house state that, you know, you have to sleep at a certain time. And it's those things where, I think because we are so much, a lot more closer now, the boundaries very easily fall off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of, for me, it's in a lesson of, I still um, have to be the parent. Yes, we are becoming closer. Yes, we are playing a lot more together. Yes, we're engaging a lot more, but I still have to be the parent. You know, we are not friends. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm your parent first. So that's that's yeah. one of the things I've uh, I've had to fight about. And also um, eating. You know, it's a meal time, but oh, she's woken up very late, so she's had a, her breakfast at uh, ten. Mm-hmm. And at lunchtime, food is served, and she's like, "I'm not hungry." I'm like, "It's meal time," and we're all eating, you know, together, or dinner time, and she's like, "I'm not hungry because she ate at four. So it's it's a lot of things that we have to work through, but I think. Uh, what it what it's been for me? It's a reminder that this house has to have a parent, and you know we know we know who the parent is, despite the fact that you know we're now really enjoying each other's time and each other's space. But there has the rules have to remain remain the rules. So I'm looking forward to the next six months. Um, fingers crossed that we're not gonna um, kill each other, <laughs> but 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 it's. Um, it's a lot of on the boundary side. And also I'm receiving a lot of questions from her in terms of, so what am I going to do for six months? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like, okay, we'll do some online tutoring uh, because we don't know, you know, it's not easy to have somebody come home. You can't go somewhere and study. So online tutoring She's like, for six months, I'm going to grow old. I'm like, everybody's growing old. I'm growing old, you know, everybody's growing old. so she even asked me if she should start a business. Because she's like, I'm feeling like I'm not doing anything. And I said, okay, you can start exploring what you can do online yeah. for now until, you know, until, until school opens. So it's been, it's so many things and it's almost as if there's no rule book. And I'm like, somebody should have written a book about how parents can deal in a pandemic, mm-hmm. you know, with all the things that, you know, that come up. And I'm like, okay, who do I call? Oh, most of my friends don't have children, especially teen kids. And so I'm like, okay, we'll play by ear, we'll play by the book. At least her dad is very harsh and very strict and very curly. So if, I, if I'm unable to, then I just call him and like, you need to talk to your daughter. And then, and then that's, that sort of gets taken care of. Wow, uh, I like it. I think, Mike, we need to write a book and uh, all of us can contribute yeah. uh, to <laughs> <laughs> in that book but I think you raised something very important maybe two points I want us to emphasize a bit on uh, one is um, uh, structure and routines uh, because that's very important for kids otherwise they get lost and a lot more Mike because uh, I talk a lot about the boy child a lot more for boys uh, they get completely lost if there's no structure girls sometimes can figure themselves out a little bit better uh, because of the multitasking mind uh, wiring that they have, uh, but boys get completely lost. So I think for the parents out there, structure is important, routine is important. They need to know when to go to bed and when to uh, rise up and when to eat. Uh, you know, those routines really help. Um, and, and they happen well in school. Now they're not in school, we need to bring it home and make sure that those routines are working. And then secondly, you talked about being authoritative. uh, Authoritative. And and just to remind us uh, before we come to you, Shalom, uh, that um, there are four main parenting styles that we talk about uh, in some of our training programs. And for the dads out there, we have intentional dads program 
uh, that we do and we're doing online. We just started one. And in case you're interested, you can let us know on the page. We'll let you know more about it. Uh, we have intentional moms as well for the mothers. And one of the things we talk about is the different parenting styles. Uh, there is the authoritarian or dictatorial, where you just do what I say, no discussion, uh, even when they're grown up. Uh, it's just more, I'm the boss. Uh, the rest are details. Uh, but number two is um, uh, the... Uh, let me see, the neglectful or the uninvolved. And neglectful sounds bad to many parents, but sometimes we are just uninvolved. You know, we are there, but we're not involved. We could be home with our kids during this time, spending a lot of time with them, uh, around them, but not with them, just around them. We can see them, but we're not really engaging them. Uh, and so we're not involved. We're not helping her. We're not talking to them about what they are watching. We're just not involved. Uh, so in essence, we have sort of neglected them, uh, even though they are around us. Uh, and then we have the permissive. And permissive is, oh, you want to stay longer tonight? No problem. Uh, oh, you really want a night, some ice cream? Well, let's do it. Uh, maybe tonight you could stay and watch two more movies. So you just permit, you just let them be, you just let them, and you're not putting in your foot, you're not being the parent, you're not being the adult in the relationship. And then lastly, which is the right one, there's the authoritative, authoritative. Terian, uh, you're so soft-spoken like me, uh, but authority doesn't have to be loud. Authority is just yeah. firm. Authority is just firm. Uh, and I tell that to especially moms of teenagers, you just have to be firm enough uh, so that they don't push you around. You need to be firm enough. You don't have to shout. You don't have to raise your voice, but they need to know that, uh, you know, there's a firmness, that, an authority that comes uh, with um, the parent. Maybe Shalom, any other, um, you could mention something on those two issues, but you could raise two or three other issues that you've uh, learned before Mike uh, gives a, uh, his comments on some of those things. Okay, I think, um, first let me address the structure bits. One of the things that I think, and Michael had alluded to it, the way you parent a zero to six is not the way you're going to parent seven to 12, is not the way you're going to parent a teenager. And so, even routine and the conversations around routine changes. And now with the pandemic, of course the routines, many routines have been thrown out the window, but also like uh, Terian was sharing, hours are extended. You know, the hours that you're watching TV, the hours that you're staying up, etc. So like when it comes to routine, if I can discuss like what happened in my house, we threw out that routine of breakfast, lunch, dinner. Mm -hmm. Two reasons. If we eat three square meals a day, they, we are going to add so much weight because we are not going anywhere. And so what I have found is that we are starting, we are having more of branches and early dinners as opposed to three, three meals, you know? And so we either stay up a little late, then wake up around six, seven o'clock, then have a chat. So like now for my daughter in particular, she's in form four and the school has continued having online classes. So they are starting their class time early. And then when she does her break, then we all congregate in the kitchen and have breakfast. And by that time, my husband has left for work, you know, things like that. So the routine has sort of shifted, but what we've done is maintained it. So for instance, today being Sunday, she has class early tomorrow. She's already gone to bed. And it, because again of starting, I, I want to insist on the early years being so, so foundational because of starting the boundary setting and the rule setting when they are younger, it becomes so much easier to do things when they are older. Because I'm finding I don't have to follow her up. I don't have to follow up her bedtime, her reading time, her meal time. Basically, what I'm doing is the psychosocial support. You know, mm -hmm. how does she continue hooking up with her friends, you know, in that pandemic? When you're talking about the book title of, you know, raising a teenager in a pandemic, it's been crazy. And so having a routine, I'd say routines are great, but routines are also shifted based on the circumstances that you have. And then when it comes to parenting, a younger child may need an authoritarian type of parent. By the time they come to the teenagehood, again, you, you have to be firm, but again, give them, give them the room to grow their own selves, you know, to grow their identity. Right now, the teenagers, 
The pandemic has not stopped their questions. In fact, it has made them more intense. Christians who are taking their teens to church by force, guess what? You can't make them go to church on Sunday anymore. There's no church to be gone to. So any questions they had about their spirituality, now is the time to actually have those conversations because it's an opportunity to show them how this God of yours can be their God, you know, help them see how they can build that relationship with God for themselves. So our boundaries will be pushed. Identity will be questioned. I mean, there'll be odd questions. Um, one of the questions I had around this time was why do armpits itch? Mm. And I've seriously never thought about why they itch, but a teenager will think about why armpits itch, you know, and mm. There'll be all sorts of questions. So I say that much as the challenges may come, there are so many extra benefits that I see. You know, um, we are having, if you're the parent of a teenager, your patience is going to grow dramatically. Your listening skills are going to grow dramatically. So we are also going to grow as people by relating with our teenagers. If you've been fake and gotten away with it, they're going to call you out. Because if you have been telling them to leave certain values and you're living different values, now the proximity is making that stick out. So the other thing that we are facing as parents of teens is this mirror in your face, you know? Anything you say should be done, you're also stuck at home, you're likely going to be spending more time on social media, yet you're telling them not to spend time on social media. And they're going to question why. So. The biggest challenge, I think, for parents of teenagers is that you have somebody who's heading to young adults and who can question and reason and will, will, not say, will not take that because I said so. You know, who says you're right? And the minute you go on the because I said so, that authoritarian parenting style that you're talking about, Pastor Ed, the minute you say that, as Michael said, they will shut down. So if this is a time to build relationships and to prepare them for the future adults they will be, you need to, as they say, just chill. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So if I may use their language, it's never yeah. that serious. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that conversation. Just to remind us, uh, children between five and eight is when they have their... Uh, uh, emotional rebirth. So they begin to have their own feelings separate from their mom and dad, and they begin to question some things. And that's when the transition from the authoritarian to the authoritative begins to move in, because now they're, they're saying, I'm not feeling cold. Why are you forcing me to wear a jacket? Uh, you know, I read a quote that uh, uh, says, uh, what's a jacket? Uh, it's what... Um, Parents uh, force, uh, mothers uh, force their children to wear when they're feeling cold, when the parent is cold, uh, is what they force them to wear. Uh, and so just realizing that as they transition five to eight, then you need to listen to them, begin to have conversation. And we're going to come back to this uh, shalom later. We're telling them not to spend many hours on technology, but what else do they do? So we're going to be talking about different things that uh, parents can do with their children during this time. But you brought up the fact of modeling, being a model, uh, and understanding there's also reverse growth or reverse mentoring that is happening during this time as we work uh, with our children. Uh, so uh, there's a lot to learn, and of course, boundaries. Uh, Mike. Uh, as you give your comments on any of the things we've talked about, um, let me ask you to say something to the parents who are not, uh, especially fathers, who may not be living with their children uh, during this season. Um, just some ways that they could get a lot more involved um, uh, and feel present, even though they may not be home. Um. My temptation is to say uh, that the situation for fathers is going to be very different from case to case. But then again, it's different for any parent with each of their children because each child is, is so unique and so different. Um, the encouragement would be to take advantage again of the current situation. Why? there is plenty more access to our children now 
because they're not necessarily in the environment of a school where it's a little more complex to pull them out or spend time with them. So for example, with one of my children, um, I've been able to more frequently spend time with her and she comes and does class from my place or from her mom's place. So school now has moved to where she is as opposed to she has to be in a specific place. Um, with my younger three children, I can go and spend time where they are in between class a little more often. And remember, I'm doing my work, hopefully, and increasingly so online. So I've got that leeway to be able to be in a specific space with them and then tell them I need to go and do my work, which speaks to what I, I wanted to highlight. And, you know, we've heard already two things that have already been mentioned, the structure, the importance of structure. But I'd say not only the structure that we tell our children to, children to follow, but the structure that we have and that we're role modeling. Um, so there's the role modeling of, do they see you do that which you say they should do? But there's also the role modeling that we have a unique opportunity, and, and I've done this in a few cases, of them seeing what is it that we do with our lives. Um, only this morning, for example, I brought one of the young girls and, and put her and told her, look, this is the work I'm doing. And they kind of tried to read what I was writing on an email. And now they're getting to know and appreciate what, you know, let me say dad's work entails. Yeah. But the, the, there are two other things I'd like to mention just before I hand over to you, um, Pastor S, that parents need to be able to take their own detox time. I, I borrowed that word, um, but detox time in just pulling away and spending that quiet time by themselves, uh, rejuvenating their minds themselves uh, so that they do not go as uh, Terrianne said, uh, you know, we wonder whether at the end of the six months, who shall be living? <laughs> who will have survived? Child or parent, you know? And, and I see this as an opportunity also for parents to do a lot of self-work. What do I mean? In this uh, situation, we've, we've had to look at our values. What do I really value? We've had to look at relationships, which relationships are really important. And what is the true essence of life? And we've had to think about it. So the self-care comes in terms of those areas that now you've seen and you know, I am a person with a challenge in this area this area and this area. For the sake of the entire family, please work on those areas because now they're in such close proximity that the effect can be very negative. But imagine if we do work on ourselves and the effect and outcome that we could have on children, uh, spouses if they're there, uh, friends and, and the society as a whole. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. In fact, I was just about to ask Teriana about how she stays sober uh, during this season. But um, let me just uh, pull out a few comments from, uh, from online. Uh, thank you for many of you are watching, huge numbers and uh, some of the things you're saying as well. Um, Tsukibe, you're saying, Terian, that's crucial rules have to be followed. Uh, Purity Kenya, you're saying, even as we talk about rules are uh, rules, uh, these young people can make your life a living hell with cold wall. Uh, they become like a um, wall you can't penetrate. Uh, the style of parenting should vary, uh, sort of situational. Children can stress you uh, until you need, to, uh, you need backup uh, from parents who are ahead of you. Uh, and that's a good point that we need to uh, to have a community of friends and parents who help us in some of these situations. Um, and then she says, reach out to all the parents, uh, that helps. And bottom line, there's no manual. Sometimes you just grapple in the darkness, uh, but no worries, you get there. Yanis Buru says, I agree, model the behavior that you want to see in your children. Uh, Wendy Miner says, uh, please also talk about the challenges that Corona has brought in terms of parents who may have lost income. Uh, we can, um, how can they parent effectively? 
uh, yeah, the primary role is uh, being a provider. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe uh, Terian, you could begin there where you talk about um, that those whose um, income has been affected or several other things are not working right. Uh, there are those moms who are not in good relationship with the fathers of the children. Uh, and so the conflicts have increased. Um, yeah, uh, and just any word on, 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 on some of those challenges some people are facing before we come to you, Shalom. All right. Um, I've been, um, well, lucky to be in a space where I have two sisters who are, who are very close um, to me. And as, a, as, a, as an individual, being a single mom, I've always been very closed up and, you know, my problems are mine, my children are mine, so I will deal with them um, on my own. But in the last um, two, three years or so, um, opening up a little bit more with my sisters, because, you know, we're all sort of going through, sim you know, we're raising kids of similar ages and we are all sort of, you know, all around the same age group. Um, so that has opened a space where we're a lot open with each other. And if I'm completely stressed out, one of my sisters will come and pick up my kids and go to, you know, and they'll go to her house. And that will give me space to, you know, to just breathe. And I feel that, you know, as, as, as mothers and especially single mothers, we always feel like we have to do everything and we have to do everything by ourselves. Otherwise, you know, we're not being good parents. And it took me a long time to actually you know, realize that if I'm not okay mentally, emotionally, then there's no way I can be a good parent to my, you know, to my children. So there's been a lot of learning, a lot of um, trying to put myself first. Um, and I know sometimes that may come off as a selfish thing, but, you know, we have to realize if we're not okay mentally, emotionally, uh, then that's when, you know, we're yelling at our kids, we're screaming, we're angry all the time. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very happy that finally I'm at the place where I can call a friend, I can call my sister and I say, please just come take these kids, uh, spend the night with them, and I will come and pick them up tomorrow when I'm fine, <laughs> and that, you know, I'm compressed. So I think for single moms, um, it's a lot. I've quit my job, I quit my job in June. And, you know, many people are like, who quits their job during Corona, you know? And, and it's not like I had planned it for six months, put aside my savings, you know, everything. But I just said, <clears throat> I know that there's things that I can do. I can push myself a little harder than I have. And I will get, you know, the kind of income that I'm looking for. But anyway, I'm also not paying fees for the next six months. So, so, so that helps. <laughs> that helps a lot. So, no, so I think, you know, as mothers, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. We should look for help when, you know, when we need to look for help. We should realize when we need to talk to somebody and we know what that feels like. It might be hard, but even if there's just one person, you can say, hey, I need to, I need to talk to somebody. Um, can I talk to you? So, and, you know, let's, let's look for the hassle when we, when, when, if we put the word out there, you know, I've, you know, I've told everybody who is listening that, if you need me to do some content for you, if you need, if you need, if you need. So just not being ashamed to ask, because I know that, you know, there's people out there who may be looking for the kind of services that I'm offering. So yeah. it'll work out. It'll work mm -hmm. out eventually. And I, you know, I, I always say I, my, the God that I serve is not a God of, uh, of poverty. So um, he knows I needed to make that decision to be, to stay sane and to take care of my kids and to put my family first. So he'll take care of whatever else. He'll be God. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Terry. And I think we just need to uh, trust God and not allow the lack of income to stress us. Uh, but I love what you said, just being able to uh, connect to the community of other mothers around us. And that's uh, pretty important. Um, maybe just to say one more time to those of you online, uh, that again, we have these parenting programs that we are doing, uh, and we have the uh, the boys to men program, mentoring for boys, that is actually going on. In fact, we have a class of 58, and we put them into small groups. 
and we are starting another class in a week. So in case you have a boy who is seven years to 17, uh, then you, you could let us know. And uh, uh, we would love, we have mentors who are trained, they're meeting these boys uh, weekly and they're talking and it's really been helpful, especially for single moms. And just to say to single moms, uh, we actually have an event on the 25th of July, uh, that is uh, next Saturday, um, 5.30 to 7. We have an event, we call it Silver Moms, which is an event for single moms. And we're gonna be talking about three striving strategies of, um, for single moms. Uh, some ways just to be have your own space on it and be able to know uh, some things that you can begin to do. So in case you're interested, uh, sign up uh, on our page or just write your name and someone is going to talk to you. Uh, Shalom. There's just so much we need to talk about. I think we need to do this again next yes. Sunday. There's just so much. Uh, uh, next Sunday, I think we'll do a part two. That is uh, so much that is being asked. Uh, so many people online uh, who are asking many questions. Uh, but um, we raised the issue of, uh, and probably next week we'll focus a lot more on the internet and some of the things around it, uh, and also sex education. Uh, but talk a bit about a, a few people asking online, how do you make sure you don't shout, shout to your children? How do you manage conflict with your children, especially at a time like this when everybody you know, feels stressed uh, once in a while? Uh, how do you manage conflict? Okay, um, well, I want to go back a little bit before I talk about the teenhood because unfortunately during teenagehood is where the cracks show. You know, when uh, we are bringing up the younger children, things are teenagehood. So one of the things I'd say that worked for me and I mean, it's helped and it's something that I technically advise people to do is start training your children to allow you time. So how this used to be for me when, and this is way pre-COVID, we didn't know there'd be anything like a pandemic. Anytime I came home from work or shopping or whatever, I would tell my kids when they were young, I've gone to change, okay? Mm -hmm. And what that meant is I'm going to go upstairs or to my room, take some time out, and I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back in different clothes and of course in a different mindset. So this thing of leaving work or wherever you are, you are from your outside, or let me say leaving your problem and then coming to face your children directly, that mm -hmm. is not giving you, is not building in transition. And therefore you're not being able to dust off the stress to then handle your mm -hmm. child. And so the relationship ends up being frustrating. So one of the things I learned is that one of, let me go change and then I'd come back mm -hmm. ready. Now, let me go change did not mean that I'm going to come back in five minutes. Sometimes I would take a shower. Sometimes I'd lie on that bed and usa. Sometimes I would weep because of the kind of day I have had, then freshen up and meet them. But it was clear that if I say I've gone to change, then you leave me alone for however long it takes, then I'll be back. But the important thing for children is to always come back because then it gives them that security. It also shows them that when you say you're going to do something, then you end up doing it. So okay. there's that when you want to build margin and you want to build um, that me time and little pockets of self-care, start teaching them early that you can be alone at, for a few moments, but I will be back, but always come back. It's yeah. in the not coming back that we build insecurity in our children. Now, if you fast okay. forward that to here we are, Corona, if I can answer the question that was asked by Wendy about losing income and parenting effectively, if you have built that relationship, and even now is a time to start, like I'm saying, it's never too late, start having conversations with them about what's going on. If you tell your teenager, I'm a bit stressed today, just give me like five, 10 minutes, they will understand that they too can be okay with their stress. Because what happens if we always pretend that we are okay when we are not, we are not showing them how to handle their own stress. And if we are not showing them, demonstrating that we can do self-care, if we are not demonstrating that we can have a bad day and we need time out, then they will not be able to speak about their emotions, which means when they are struggling with whatever they are struggling with right now with Corona, they are not able to say, I'm stressed, mom, I need time out. Yeah. Or I'm stressed, dad, I need yeah. time out. So we need to show that again by yeah. example. 
And so now when it comes to you've lost your income, I think we should be leveraging on the stuff our teenagers know. And like you're saying, the time will come when we'll talk about social media and all. But right now, home-based businesses are thriving when they have an online presence. And truth be told, our teenagers know more about that online space than we do. So they're going to be able to build an Instagram page for you, promote stuff, call their friends, you know, rally people around the whatever products you will choose to sell. So you may be deciding right now, again, the other big thing, we are all stuck at home, people are adding weight, so healthy eating is one of the big things. Corona is about, you need to build your immunity. So healthy juices are a big thing. If you actually started blending the garlic, ginger, honey, lemon, and freezing it in bottles and get your teenager to do this nice label because they know the software to do the label, and you start selling that thing, you will find that you're having income and you're also showing your child that they can be part of the solution to the problem. And that's just an example of many things. So what I'm saying is teens are in a position to be part of the solution to the problems we are facing. Are they even ready? What if they were grown up right now? Let me start with that. If your teen, being who they are right now, was a grown up in this 2020, would they have survived this pandemic? Do they have the coping skills necessary to survive this? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, what can you do to then build them and have them ready for the next crisis? Because we have no idea what the crisis will be in 10 years time, when they're 24, when they're 29, when they're 30, and they're the ones losing their jobs. Are they going to be able to handle that crisis? So I feel we need to be building them for their future but using the present crisis and leveraging on the skills that they have during this present crisis to get them ready for that. And so, you know, what Terian was saying, having a village, like for me, I would never have survived parenting without a village around my kids and without a village around myself. And the village is not just about people who are your age. It's about people who will support your child. I'm not cool to my daughter. But if I have somebody in her village who's like 10 years her senior, that person is cool. And that person will be able to pass on a certain message I want. So we don't parent with only other parents. Let's parent with other people who matter to our children, who are going to be role models to our children and cut them across the ages. I actually talk a bit more about that in the book, you know, building a village around your child. I think that's important to help us survive this. Uh, that's great. And um, uh, again, in case you'd like to get the book uh, that Shalom is talking about, uh, feel free to let us know uh, on the page and we'll organize for how that happens. Um, and to remind the single moms again on the 25th, uh, which is two weeks to come, we're going to have a forum uh, for the single moms and we'll talk about strategies of survival. And we're looking forward to that. But definitely, I think we're going to do this again uh, next Sunday, part two. There's just so much to talk about. Uh, talking about mentors, Shalom, uh, I think you know this, uh, when my kids got to 13, uh, then they got uh, mentors and you have worked with my daughter as well. Uh, and they go there, they hang out with them, uh, they get to hear the same things I talk about that, uh, you know, the other, uh, the mentors out there look like they're cool, uh, cooler than dad uh, and mom, and uh, they get listened to and we work together to, uh, to make this work. Uh, so that's important. One uh, last thing I'd like to say before I come to you, Mike, uh, we lost you for a minute, but we're glad you're here. Um, and, and there's a lot that we're talking about. I'm sure you're going to give your comments on. Uh, but one of the topics we go through in uh, intentional dads and also intentional moms uh, is we talk about the six building blocks of character, how to prepare your children to survive without you. Uh, so by the time they leave home, they could survive any situation. And we talk about relationships, how they build relationships with other people, interdependence. We talk about reality. They need to understand reality, that stuff happens. And when it happens, they need to deal with it, like COVID-19. Uh, we talk about responsibility, how to be responsible for yourself and for your space. Uh, we talk about morality, spirituality, and competence. And so we just talk about building these things into your children uh, so that when they leave home, uh, they can live well without you. I think that's a goal of parenting, to 
release your children to live life without you and live okay. Uh, not, uh, not, um, uh, not feel like they need you every time, yet they have left home. Uh, so anyway, Mike, talking about mental health, um, some of our kids have not taken this very well. Uh, you know, there are some that I've had to talk to and the parents who have called me and said, my son is not taking this very, very well. Uh, he seems to be slipping into depression. Uh, he's not talking much and all of that. And we always have a talk and then I also recommend uh, for them to see uh, specialists like yourself. Uh, but just some general advice on how to help our children maintain mental health during this season. In general terms then, I'd say we need to help our children continue uh, developing and engaging physically, uh, developing and engaging with their emotions and uh, society generally, and also developing and engaging spiritually. What the pandemic has done, it has brought us into this smaller space. And though many might not admit it, there was a lot of confusion, especially at the beginning. And that confusion has extended as we go on in terms of what exactly is going on, what is happening, what do I do with myself in this situation? So our children, as we are confused, have found themselves having to cope alone without the necessary support from ourselves. So I'd say first, as a parent, provide your support. That um, to one extent or the other, just as we were saying, authoritative, well then, who's the adult? The adult is yourself, which means you need to put aside some of the challenges that you're having so that you take care of the challenges that are your children's and be that support. Um, physically, though we are told we should not um, interact with other people, it, it is important to engage physically with them. It might not mean leaving the house, but helping them expend that energy to get their bodies moving and working. I believe it's also important, and I think Terian might have uh, alluded to, no, there's a psychosocial that Shalom spoke about, that you provide that environment where they can have, continue having their friendships, their interaction with friend, friends and family. And I've heard many people uh, saying that they have weekly, uh, Zoom family meetings with the extended family. And in fact, to some extent, I think some families are meeting more now than they might have met before because of this setup. Yeah. So that's an essential one with family, with friends, and also just a, a good social setup within the home where you're playing games, as we mentioned earlier. The, the spiritual, um, and, and this I'd say a lot more from the role modeling also than the dictation, dictation as Shalom was saying, because they, they will do what they see us do. They will do it the way they see us do it. So are we helping them find the, that space where they do their meditation and prayer? Are we helping them find that time to uh, read whatever it might be, the Bible or a Bible study guide, which you can do together or they can do and you discuss it. Uh, th those are in, in broad and general terms. But okay. when is it that we have depression? It would be good to be able to notice when this is happening and, and what you alluded to are good signs that, you know, someone who does not want to really interact, does not want to talk, they're cooped up in their rooms, but it also has to happen over a long period of time consistently. So if they do come out, you know, after two days, then it's not yet time to say, you know, panic. Um, if they're coming out every day at some point and they do interact, but it's just not the way you want them to interact, that's a totally different uh, conversation. So I'd say support them spiritually support them physically and support um, their emotional, uh, psychological growth. Okay. Uh, well, very, uh, very well. Uh, I think Terri-Ann uh, should be back uh, shortly. Uh, Terri-Ann, 
uh, it's good to see you back because someone has a uh, you know a question here. Wangare Kimboy says, my five-year-old still doesn't understand why mommy needs to be alone sometimes. Uh, and I'm sure that's real for you. You still have uh, someone young. Uh, what are some of the ways that you can let these little ones understand mommy needs some time alone, uh, you know? And, and I, I think uh, early in our parenting, all our kids are grown up now. The last born is 11. Uh, yeah, yeah, we had to put in those boundaries and say, when we go to the room, uh, uh, unless you really need to knock, then wait for us, we'll be out. And if you knock, you need to wait. And if we, didn't, uh, we don't say uh, come in, uh, then just stay away. Uh, you know, being able to, because it's also teaching them boundaries for, the, uh, for them to learn for their future. And that boundaries are important. Nobody needs to invade my space of course, except to the adults in this case. And next week we'll talk about uh, internet and other things. And now as parents, uh, we have a right to inspect, uh, of course, negotiated and informed rights, uh, not just busting into their space anytime. But as long as they're young, uh, we are there to help them as adults. But maybe any advice to the younger parents, just in terms of making sure you have your own space, uh, but also you're available for the children. Uh, I, th I honestly think Shalom uh, is better placed to answer to answer that question. Um, though, uh, from my you know from my own experience, it's the same thing. It's it's building the boundaries early enough. Um, you know, from as young as minus two, and even though it's a lot harder, you know, to build boundaries with a two-year-old. Um, but you know, the younger they are, the better it is. By the time they're getting to when you can actually begin to have a conversation, then they know that it's mommy's time, it's mommy's room, it's mommy's uh, uh, space, and therefore mm -hmm. that's her space. And then you also have your space, you know, as a mm -hmm. child. And if you want to, you know, take time off, I want to read, or I want to, as a, you know, five, 10, 12, 13 year old, then you can. But I think the earlier you start, the better. But I honestly think, uh, Michael and, and Shalom would be better place to, to really answer that question. Yeah, maybe uh, before we leave you, just uh, any other advice that you would give to the parents, uh, the younger parents during this time, something that has really worked for you before we come to Shalom? Um, my daughter just came to pick my charger from the room. Uh, okay, no, no, <laughs> no problem. We can give you a minute and... Uh, Okay. Oh, no, you're okay. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I think what worked for me, uh, and especially with Imani, because she's um, she's 14. That's the older one. Was mm -hmm. that I, I had a mentor who, you know, really believed in good parenting, almost like the nanny nine. Was it nanny nine one one nanny nine nine nine? Mm -hmm. You remember that very strict <laughs> parenting. And, and, you know, there was a book that I was given from by uh, one of the pastor's wives in, you know, how to raise children. It was, I think it was called Happy, Happy Parenting or Secrets to Happy Parenting. And, you know, I really stuck by it. Everything from sleep training uh, to how, to, you know, how to, what time to eat, what time to go to bed, uh, tidying up when you play with your toys. So sometimes we forget these things because you know we want to do the cuddles and then we end up doing all the work but i think as in kiswahili they say you know uh this something about samaki mkunji akiwa mbichi yeah so the the Maybe earlier we will help us uh, i don't know that one yeah <laughs> the the earlier the earlier you the earlier we take them through why it's important to have structure why it's important to respect the structure of that has been set by the parents, then you know it's easier you know to go along. Whether you're a single parent or you have the support of you know of a spouse or the father of the child, so you know learning earlier on that these are the rules of the house and everybody in this house has to abide by the rules. Even when my friends' kids come home and they have other rules at their house, in my house, if the rules are this, then we don't break them. Um, and my daughter, when she goes to their house, she can do what they do there. But in my house, we keep our rules as they are. I love it. You know, children like to compare a lot, uh, Shalom, especially 
teenagers uh, to yes. say those yes. guys are doing it. Uh, why can't we do it? So uh, jokingly, I've told my children before, do you want to change residence <laughs> or parenting? <laughs> uh, because we are different and we do things differently. Uh, but they get to uh, get the point. But before we come to you, Shalom, uh, there's this just connection with teenagers, especially. Uh, Mike talks about the emotions, understanding each other's emotions. Uh, and I know from psychology, mothers are especially crucial in training their children to understand their own emotions, uh, containment, the process of containment, to understand their emotions and manage their emotions. And one of the things we talk about, especially in the men's program, uh, because men rarely understand how to name their emotions. Um, you know, psychologists divide their primary emotions differently, but uh, I think we like this one better, the six uh, of them. Uh, but being scared, being angry, uh, being, uh, what is it, sad, uh, you know, scared, angry, sad, uh, just mentioning those so that the kids may understand, uh, being happy, being excited about the future, um, and being tender, which is empathetic towards others. And so uh, we like to sit down sometimes around the table and with our children, everyone says what they are feeling around those six feelings and emotions. And that helps because I get to say, I feel angry today, I'm frustrated because this happened uh, or because I can't go out and I really want to go out. And that really helps children to be able to express themselves and all of you to get to connect. Shalom, many advice in connecting with our children, especially around emotions. During teenage, there's just an emotional turmoil. Uh, they're excited in one minute, the next they're angry with you and they want to bang the door and stuff like that. How do you connect to them, especially during this time when emotions intensify? <laughs> well, again, teenagers, you know that, the unfortunate thing about teenagehood is that it's not the beginning, you know? And so using that magic number 10, if you actually allowed your child to throw a tantrum at three, then at 13, they're still going to throw one, you know, if you didn't change anything somewhere in between. And so I think the way, way to address this is to look at a teenager who was set for boundaries from the get-go versus a teenager who was not set for boundaries from the get-go. Now, the one who was set for boundaries and who was taught how to express those emotions, you know, when thunder struck and they were two years old and they're wondering what's going on, you didn't tell them don't be scared. You affirmed and acknowledged they're being scared. You know, when they were sad about something, if you're sad about something, if you have taught your child to express their emotions, then this just where you actually have not connected and here you are now stuck together in the same space. One of the things you need to do is understand that there are, let me say, little adults in terms of the things they're feeling. And then on top of that, as Michael had uh, talked about earlier, they're hormonal. So there are things going on in their bodies and they have no clue what's happening. So they don't know why their mood is going crazy. They don't know why now they're happy and then they're not. And that's when they start giving each other titles like being bipolar, you know, because their, moods are, their mood swings are going crazy. So it's to help them understand. I mean, like for me and my teenagers, when they got to their different stages, cause like my biological children have a six year gap between them. So like for the boy that I specifically address the emotions that boys go through and the things that would frustrate them. It's calling it what it is. For my daughter, the same. For my stepdaughter, the same thing. At their stage, I will talk about this is the thing that you're going through. If these boobs that are growing are embarrassing you, how do we talk about the embarrassment and how do we cover for that? You know, if you're sad that your crush has actually not even noticed you, how do we acknowledge that you're sad that he didn't notice you and what do we do about it? So that you're not shushing their emotions, but you're helping them express them and deal with them. And the minute you connect at that level, the minute you show them that you care about what they're feeling, then they release a bit more, you know? Yeah. There, <laughs> again, you know, the funny thing about this parenting journey is that you discover things as you go along. Now my son in his 20s releases little by little information of things that he did when he was 13, 14 years old and tells me there's no way mama was going to tell you that at that time, you would have killed me. And you know, we still survived. 
So here's the thing. As a parent of a teen, you may not know everything that's going on in the room. Yeah. life but mm -hmm. you need no matter what because as they grow they're going to make huge mistakes and they will need to know that you have their back so whenever they did something here's the other thing teenagers do not think that you are not a teen one day i mean how do i put this teenagers think that you are never a teenager so they think that they are the first ones to be going through the thing that they are going through if that makes sense yeah. because they met you as an adult mm -hmm. so even when they say you don't get me they don't understand that you yourself probably went through the same thing. So I feel it's good to be honest with our teens and tell them I also went through a certain thing. But how I did this, when they were younger, I would tell them that I have an eye behind my head, you know? And I would tell them there are things that I will know whether you like me to know or not. When I wanted to push them towards understanding that I don't parent alone and I parent with God, I would tell them God will tell me what I need to know. So... A lot of the time, it's not like God would directly tell me, but somebody would discover something that they have done, tell me about it, and I, I confront them with it. And I tell them, listen, between me and God, we want the best for you, but he's the one who doesn't sleep. So even if you do things behind my back, God sees them. And at the right time, he reveals them to me so that I can help address them. So we are going to talk about this. Now, what has happened as they have grown through the stages, it has made it easy for us to talk about sexuality because they would watch something and not tell me about it. But then when I come and check history, I see they were watching something. But then I tell them, God revealed it. I mean, why did I come to check history when I could have been doing something else? So it's important to do several things. Let your children know that you actually parent with God. You're not just doing it yourself. Let them understand that you were there before. So you have walked that journey and then let them know you have their back because in this hormonal mess and the confusion and wonder mm -hmm. what are the emotions and what's going on let them feel mm -hmm. something that they think is wrong you have their back they can come to you and ask the questions and sometimes they will not ask you so back to the village if they are scared of asking you provide your teenagers with somebody else that they can ask let them know that if you're scared of asking me, ask so-and-so. Mm. And then they can help you deal with it. So that the same way your teen doesn't think you're all that, let them know that you're not all that. Let them know that you, they can get help from somebody else. Because here's the thing, if you're not there, who would they go to? Let them start understanding yeah. that they can seek that help from somebody else. So when you're real with them, mm. then you connect on a real level. So open communication, making sure that the other people that they can talk to. Mike, I'm going to come to you. We are almost winding up here. Time just flies. Uh, so we're definitely going to do part two uh, next week. Uh, but um, uh, during this time, there are lots of parents who are scared. How do you make sure you don't uh, transfer that? I'm forgetting the, yeah. the right word uh, psychologically. Uh, but to your children. Uh, the, you, you feel scared, you, you really uh, wonder, uh, you know, scared of getting sick and, and all of that, or maybe the children are scared as well. Uh, how do you deal with that uh, for yourself as a parent, uh, but also uh, for the young ones? Uh, but before we come to you, and then after, uh, after that, you could give us your uh, last comments to the parents. Um, instruction and then we'll go around and just say our last comments unfortunately time is just gone uh, I just wanted to say uh, one of the topics we go through in intentional moms and intentional dads uh, we actually talk about uh, parenting through the developmental stages uh, so we actually talk about five to eight what's going on what do you need to do with the children then eight to uh, uh, 10 and 10 to 12 and 12 13 to 17 uh, so we have all of that uh, and it really helps to know what's going on with the children and what they are looking for and what they need from mom or dad so again uh, those of you may want to get involved in those programs you're welcome uh, shalom someone is asking how much your book is um so you will let us know as you do your final comments uh mike how do we deal with fear during this season either in the parent or in the child thank you may, may i just respond to something that shalom said uh with regard to teenagers that um what, what was it shalom 
uh, the teenagers don't think that we were teenagers Ever at teenagers. any point. Yes. Yeah. But there's also a truth that as parents, we often behave as if we were never teenagers. Yes. And, and it takes a very uh, self-aware parent <laughs> to remember that they did a few things, they were of certain way, and, and that this is, this is technically normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I alluded to it earlier, the role modeling. Mm -hmm. A scared parent equals a scared child. And therefore, if you don't want the children to be overwhelmingly taken up by the fear, I think, and I, it seem, I feel like I'm going in a circle, Pastor Simon, the parent needs to do the work that they need to do on themselves also. Okay. So if those coping skills, where, where can you get the coping skills? How, where can you learn? Today, everyone is online. Go read about it. Go seek some help online. If it's really not the kind of help because the fear has reached a certain level, get the professional help. Mm. So we can talk with our friends. We can go and look at what's online to or, or read Shalom's book or mm. now get professional help. Because I, I can't emphasize how much we create the environment that our children exist in. And if that environment is toxic, is mm. full of fear, is joyful, is structured, is stable, then we transfer that. And so my response to that fear is, if there is fear in the parent, the parent needs to work on that fear and sooner rather than later. There are professionals to help out, there is faith. And, and when I say professionals, I think I should you know, broaden it and say, there are psychologists, there are pastors, um, who, people who are trained and capable and able to take us through dealing with either perceived or real things that are causing us the fear. I think in this case, it's, it's actually very real. So we have to find practical ways of coping with it. Um, as, I, as I conclude, uh, if, the, if I answered your question, Pastor Simon. Yeah, you did. Um, and maybe you could also say as you conclude whether you are available for counseling and people could seek you out as well. Oh, well, now that you give me that opportunity, Pastor, I'll say uh, I'm available for counseling, I'm available for coaching. And as we say it at uh, Serenity Group, um, we help people unlock the past, counseling, envision the future, coaching, so that they can live more in the present with regard to how you communicate with people. So yes, I, I am available. And thank you, Pastor, for that opportunity. I'd like to conclude with two things. One, that in the six months that are ahead of us, may we courageously yet wisely simulate situations that help our children grow in character. What, what do I mean? I, I have a, a, the picture of you know a circus, for example. There is a safety net. So the acrobats can do many different things. In training, they will fall, but they can do many different things. And I think our children are in training. And once they train, fall a few times, and we catch them, and they fall, and we catch them, at some point, they will become very good, and they won't fall. So let's simulate situations for them in terms of how they interact with community, society, with family, with God, um, how they spend time on their own and the like. The other thing I'd like to say is encourage all parents um, that, you know, barring extremities and situations that, uh, that I don't think we're looking at today, there is no better parent for those children or that child than mm -hmm. yourselves. Yeah. So walk by faith also and take that stride. You know your child or you're the best placed person to know your child and to interact with them in a manner that will 
give them the greatest opportunity. So with this, these six months, whilst we're worried because, you know, school, school to some degree had become the place we comfortably sent our children and we didn't have to deal with a lot of who they are. And now I, I feel that things have been put, you know, in, in right order. First, the parent has to deal with who their child is. And then the teacher, the institutions help embellish on what we have done, the core and basic work. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Pastor Simon, for having me. It was great chatting with you, Shalom and Terry Ann, after a long time. And for the attention that was given. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, again, in case you want to uh, follow Mike, I think uh, check him out. He should be on Facebook as well. Uh, or let us know and we will share his contacts. Uh, but uh, if you need counseling uh, or coaching, please uh, do uh, get to him. Uh, Terry Ann, uh, any last words? Yes, Pastor S, and I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. I'll try and keep it very short. Um, when this COVID uh, pandemic period started, my daughter's godmother came to stay with us for a bit, and she's a lady I've grown up with. We, you know, we've gone to the same youth group. We've basically known each other since we were teenagers, and and you know she's a god fearing woman she's an amazing lady and just the perfect company and the perfect village <laughs> part of the village for for my kids and so when she came um you know about a few days later she says we need to start doing a gratitude journal together uh in the evenings and for me that was such a huge game changer um because it's myself her and my older daughter so we, you know, sit down um, every evening, you write your gratitude list, gratitude, gratitude list. And then we would all sort of uh, talk about, you know, what am I thankful for today? What are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? And for me, it's those, you know, it's, it's those little things that don't feel, uh, you know, it, it wasn't like this crazy big idea, but it made, it has made such a big difference in how we live together and just, you know, listening to my daughter saying some of the things that she's thankful for, you know, some things you're like, huh, what, that? And it's, and I'd like to just challenge other parents as well. It, it doesn't have to be grand, but it could be small things. And sometimes we felt like, gosh, 10 things today so much. Can we do five? And, you know, it still made such a big difference. We would come together and we still do not as often as we should um, but it all, it has made such a big difference in in our home and and I would like to challenge the same you know for for you as well and for other parents who are watching that you know you can make it once a week you can make it every day if you can but just for all of you as a family to come together and say what are we thankful for today and that has made uh, it's it's a part of the highlights of this COVID season for me and my and my home. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. I love it. Uh, just uh, being able to uh, talk about what we are grateful about. That's uh, just having a positive outlook uh, in this season. So thank you very much. Attitude of gratitude. Uh, Shalom. Uh, final words. I know we have over a short time. Uh, so apologies to all of you who have been watching. I think this is just uh, an enormous uh, topic and we're going to get back to it next Sunday. Shalom. Um, a, a ritual that helped, uh, again, when we, were, when we were growing up, let me call it we were growing up because I have grown up as my kids were growing up. Every morning we would knock at somebody's door and say good morning. And when we meet for breakfast, when we meet for breakfast, we would talk about how was your night? I mean, it's a question of sometimes the answer would be I was asleep, I don't know. But it became a ritual of how was your night? And then at the end of the day, we would ask how was your day? And because of having that ritual, we got to the point where we actually expressed how the day actually was. And some days have been so lousy that, you know, like my son would come from work and say, I do not feel like talking about it, you know? And then we know that the next morning we're going to ask, how was your night? Was it restful? Are you okay? What happened yesterday? You know, all of asking, 
at least getting to know how was everybody's last 12 hours or so. So such rituals may seem like nothing or may seem like a bother sometimes, but I have found having parented the number of years that I have parented, they have become a very useful thing right now. Then the other thing I'd like to say is in forms of, um, in the form of encouragement, it's never too late to re-engage and redeploy your child. I'll use the military uh, term because we are preparing our kids for war. You know, as Michael Oya is saying, it's okay to let them fall and it's okay for you to fall. So if anybody is listening here and feeling, shucks, I may have made a mistake as I was, you know, bringing up my child. It's okay. It's okay to actually step back and say, guess what? We are re-engaging. There was a time I remember, like for me, I wasn't born again from the beginning of my children's life. So how I parented them before and after are very, very different. And so a time came when I told them, guys, this is how I'm going to do my parenting from now on. We are re-engaging. Why? Because I saw, when I looked forward into their future, I saw that if I continue on the track that I am on, I will mess them up. You know, I will have contributed. I really love what you said. We create the environment that our children exist in. When I looked forward and saw the environment I was creating for my children, I decided I need to step back and re-engage. And so this is an encouragement to every parent. Now is the best time to start if you have not started. Step back re-engage, look ahead, see what it is that your teen is going to be if they continue on their current trajectory. Come back and decide, how am I going to redeploy them? Because if they were headed to a future of destruction, you have an opportunity to head them into a future that is thriving, not just surviving. Yeah, so I think that is what I would say in terms of uh, closing words. Let's be encouraged. This is a journey. It's not a one-time thing. Thank you. How much is your book? Shall yeah. I? And probably then yeah, it's it's 500 shillings. Okay. It's called Eggs, Hammers, and Chili Peppers. Uh -huh. And it's available like through our social media, but also at Keswick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we will let uh, everyone know. Thank you, everyone. It's really so good to have you, Michael, here. We're, we're so glad. Thank you, Terry Ann. Uh, exciting to have you here. Uh, and thank you, Shalom. It's been very enriching. We have talked a lot. Parents, these are my last words. As we continue to do what God has called us to do uh, as parents, uh, from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 to 4, it talks about as parents training our children to obey and to honor, uh, to respect. Uh, and that's part of what we are training them for life so that they may live a long and good life. Uh, as they learn those things. Uh, but so the Bible tells us to train them in the ways of the Lord. So we're to be engaged with them and train them in the right ways. And as we do that, we should not exasperate them. That's the old English word used there, which means not push them to a corner, not annoy them, not crush them, uh, not hurt them. Uh, and so may we all learn as we grow uh, to be the kind of parents who will not hurt our children but we'll bless them, we'll lift them up, we'll uh, uh, speak life into them uh, and also uh, uh, provide the kind of atmosphere that they'll grow up to their God-given potential. So we play a very important role, dads, um, just a word from you because I'm passionate about dads, let's do our best. You know, sometimes we're not as involved uh, as moms are. And I just want to challenge all the fathers. Our presence is very important. Let's be engaged during this season. Uh, let's recover the lost time and let's connect with our children. Thanks everyone. As I said earlier, we have many programs that are happening uh, and all the guests have different things they do. Shalom does some mentoring for girls as well. Uh, feel free to ask us on our page any, uh, uh, anything that you'd like to get involved in, uh, the programs or mentoring, uh, or even books. Uh, we have uh, books on fathering, books for boys, boys to men, uh, and we would love to be of help uh, to you. Thanks again, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, we look forward to being together again next Sunday. But uh, to all of you, that many of you that have been with us and stuck with us to the very end, and those of you who have uh, uh, written messages, um, the men did not write, but uh, so many messages from the ladies. Men, next time, say something. Uh, from all of us, have a good night, and we're grateful that you joined us. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Shalom. Thanks, Terry Ann.
Right. 